So I never got a chance to post a follow-up video to my response to Gear Up, who's posting videos on Venom Fang X's channel now. Um, unfortunately, uh, Gear Up refuses to um, approve my response, so it hasn't shown up yet um, underneath his video. I did post a link to it in my response to him, though. And, um, you know, I, I found that somewhat disappointing because he's accusing, um, you know, what are we going to call them, the evolutionists, I guess, of propaganda, of, you know, only giving their point of view without showing, you know, the other points of view, which would be his Christian, Gerup's Christian point of view. And yet, Gerup himself is um, filtering the points of view which he is allowing uh, to appear associated with with his video. Um, so, you know, but I think, you know, I, I really enjoy um, learning about evolution and finding ways of interpreting it um, that don't necessarily prevent us from being um, spiritual, if not religious. Um, certainly a literal interpretation of Genesis is no longer um, possible in light of evolutionary facts. Um, this doesn't mean that we can't interpret it in a more mythopoeic sense, um, in a more metaphorical sense. Um, but the problem is people want creationism to be a scientific theory um, in the way of intelligent design. And, you know, the intelligent design approach doesn't necessarily say that the universe is only 6,000 years old, but um, it still requires seeing uh, organic life forms as somehow designed um, from the outside by some sort of um, architect or, or craftsman or designer. Um, and what's interesting is that both the intelligent design uh, crowd and the, I'll call them the Darwinists, um, but by Darwinists I mean those who think that um, the mechanical process of random gene mutation and natural selection, which is not random, um, th those who think that that is, account, uh, is enough to account for um, all of the diversity of um, organisms which we see on this planet, those will be called the Darwinists. Um, they both, Darwinists and intelligent designers, consider the organism to be nothing but a, a machine uh, composed of, of parts that were designed based on some outside influence. In the case of the Darwinists, the outside influence is a pre-given uh, environment, and in the case of an intelligent uh, designer, um, or the intelligent design um, crowd, the outside force is is God or you know some sort of intelligent craftsman. Um, you know I think they, the intelligent design people don't want to say that it's necessarily God, but you know may as well call it that. Um, and you know my perspective is that let's not look at organisms as machines because organisms are um, their order and their form is constructed and created from the inside out. Um, and that's why I see both a, a, um, a literalist Darwinist perspective and a literalist um, creationist perspective as equally um, limited and, at the end of the day, misguided, because what's really significant about life is the fact that each individual organism is a self-organizing system. Darwin's theory doesn't account for that. Darwin's theory accounts for some of the ways in which self-organizing systems, which already exist, can uh, differentiate over time, over vast periods of time, based on um, deviations in their genetic code and um, selection caused by um, fitness to the environment, um, or lack of fitness to the environment. Um, but there is no explanation within Darwin's theory of natural selection for what is essential to life, and that is self-organization. 
Um, Darwin's theory assumes self-organizing organisms which can reproduce. And you know, the reason that I say Darwin's theory doesn't explain life or evolution for that matter is that it, it doesn't account for the order which emerges um, from this self-organizing uh, process that we call life. Um, and so to say that the genetic mutations are merely random and that the only reason organisms have form at all is because they're merely fitting into a pre-given niche in, in, a, in an environment that's already there. Um, the reason I don't think that that's adequate is that the gene, uh, the genome itself as a whole is also self-organizing. Um, and so there is a certain degree of order uh, and complexity um, present in the genome that, that gives it what we could call intelligence. And so it's not merely randomly um, um, changing due to cosmic rays or free radicals or whatever. There may be an order to mutation, a reason for a mutation. Um, and, you know, Darwin thought that evolution took place very gradually, and, and that's sort of been, um, that viewpoint has been um, sort of overtaken by um, a viewpoint of punctuated equilibrium, where actually the change in a uh, phenotype of organisms takes place due to some sort of catastrophe where um, a, a sector of a population is isolated and it, and it mutates and alters its form very quickly rather than over a very gradual, um, rather than over a very long period of time very gradually. And this would lead you to believe, or leads me to believe, that under periods of high stress, uh, the genome and, you know, the organism as a whole is it somehow becomes more likely to adapt to its surroundings. Um, and, you know, we see this actually in some studies done on uh, bacteria, that when the food supply is lowered and it's a very high-stress situation, the rate of, of mutation will increase to allow the bacterium to find uh, the right gene to synthesize a protein that can break down a different sort of food source that would be present in the environment. And so it literally learns how to metabolize um, a new source of food by increasing the rate of mutation when its normal source of food um, is lacking. And so there's something to the genome being a self-organizing system in and of itself, able to respond in what you know we can only call an intelligent way to its environment. Um, and you know, within evolutionary science, there's still uh, a bit of um, you know, more and more discussion going on about whether or not uh, Lamarck was completely wrong. Um, you know, certainly the notion that the, the germ cells, the sexual cells that actually carry the genes that are reproduced in the soma, the body, the rest of the DNA, um, are separated, that's uh, true to a certain extent, but most of life, um, the vast majority of species on this planet are not organized in that way. That's only very complex animals. Um, and very complex animals, you know, have what we, we could call Baldwinian uh, selection acting on them, which is that, you know, the organism itself as a whole, beyond its mere collection of genes, um, can pass on certain behaviors to its young, and that would give them a selective advantage so that um, the intelligence of the organism as a whole plays a role in evolution, and it's not simply this blind selection. Um, so there's room in our understanding of evolution to see nature itself as intelligent um, and as creative and as, uh, of nature as capable of um, finding to solutions to a problem in a non-random way. And, you know, science can never prove that God exists, um, but nor can it prove that God does not exist. And, you know, certainly there are um, certain problems once we've allowed evolution into our picture of the universe for the traditional picture 
that, you know, let's just go with the traditional Christian picture of the universe. Um, you know, there's the problem of evil. There's the problem of, you know, human beings being created in the image of God. Um, but I think we can, we can solve these problems with a little, you know, ingenuity and innovation on our part as uh, myth makers. Um, and I mean myth in the highest sense of the word as, as the stories which provide our lives and the universe with meaning. I think the human mind is fundamentally a myth-making machine. Um, and, you know, if you'll forgive the metaphor, and uh, even when we're doing science, we are making myths to explain phenomena. Scientific myths are very detailed, um, very well um, uh, established based on evidence and so forth, but the facts alone um, mean nothing until we interpret them. And when we interpret them, we tell a story. And what really seems to be dividing our culture at the current moment is the type of story we want to tell about the universe, about life on Earth, and about the human place within um, the biosphere, um, and also the human future. And it has, you know, it has little to do with scientific fact. Because based on scientific fact, um, there is plenty of room to see the universe as a meaningful unfolding of created advance uh, into a future which, you know, based on the past, we can only assume will be more complex and, and uh, more beautiful um, than it has already become. Um, and, you know, that would be part of the solution to this issue of evil. Certainly, there's a lot of death along the way leading up to this particular moment in time. Um, you know, the very shapes of our bodies, the very uh, attributes and traits that we now possess, are in large part a result of the billions upon billions of organisms which have died before us. So our form is a gift from the deaths of countless beings before us. Um, and in terms of our existing in the image of God, you know, why can't the image of God be trying to manifest itself through billions of years of organic uh, evolution? Um, you know, for us, for human beings, 14 billion years since the Big Bang is a long time. Um, but for God, that's, you know, six days maybe. Who knows? Um so we've got to get more creative with our myth making um, and more cooperative because ultimately we, we live on a single planet and unless we can come to agree about the meaning of our existence on this planet, we're going to destroy ourselves very soon, unfortunately. Uh, but I hope that we can, with the help of mediums like this, uh, we can communicate with one another and we can begin to share perspectives such that Hopefully, quickly, we can develop um, a common understanding of our place in the universe. Um, that's my hope, at least. And, you know, that's why I, I make as many videos as I do. That's really my motivation at the end of the day. Um, so I welcome anyone else who wants to participate in, in this task, this, this uh, mission that I think... You know, anyone who is serious about uh, life would be called to participate in this mission, which is, at the end of the day, it's about saving the world. Um, because if you look at it, there's so many different uh, trajectories that the human race is on in the current moment that lead us to complete extinction within the next century. And unless we drastically alter, um, you know, our very consciousness, um, we can't change those trajectories. So, yeah, thanks for listening, and uh, of course, let me know what you think. Take it easy.